We're months away from the crucifixion. All semester long, we have been following Christ's path. We have been watching as he has developed from a baby into a man. From a man to a priest and a prophet and a healer and a teacher. To eventually becoming our Savior. Today we start a two-week uh, teaching series called My End Has Come. When I'm done next week, we'll have read the entire Gospel of Luke. And starting in two weeks, Sam is going to start our next book, which is the Gospel of John. And he'll be teaching all the way through probably January, February, I think mid-February is when he'll finish. And then we'll start the book of Acts. First off, I'm very proud of all of you guys um, for really sticking with this program and, and investing in it and really diving into it. Um, I know that you know Natalie comes home and, and tells me how much the girls have these great discussions, and Sam tells me, you know, the next day he texts me and tells me how great you, you know, junior high boys just really dive into this. Um, and I've been in, in with the senior high boys a couple different times, and and they've really asked some hard questions. And I'm very proud of all of you for for truly accepting what we're doing. Um, this is not easy. Very few youth groups do it this way. Um, but I really felt like God said, you know what? This ministry has gotten to a point where they're spiritually ready to be challenged. And you've risen to that challenge. So tonight we're going to be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. This is God's Word. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow putting two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said. This poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, Watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name. Claiming, I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. This will result in being witnesses to them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. By staying firm, you will gain life. Will you pray with me? Lord, I want to give thanks to you for this semester. I want to give thanks to you for the, the gospel of Luke that you have provided us and the strength to persevere during this difficult time of really trying to discern your will, Lord. Father, I ask that as we finish out your, your gospel, that we truly connect to our Lord and Savior. That we truly understand what he came and did for us. So that we can be transformed and created anew. So that we can go into the world and be your hands and feet. In the name of my prayer. Amen. Amen. So throughout the gospel of Luke, we have seen numerous times how he focuses on those who are the outcasts. Those who are lower in society, second-rate citizens, slaves, lepers, women, children, people that the general population ostracizes and stays away from. And he's intentional in this because he wants to demonstrate 
how Christ befriends them, how Christ loves them regardless of who they are, where they're at, or what they've done. It doesn't matter what, what law says, what the Old Testament says, he does what is right, even at the cost of his own life. In the beginning of, of chapter 21, we see a story of this widow putting in her very last copper coins into the offering plate. And this story is actually found in most other Gospels. But Luke does something unique. He changes it. And he changes it for a very specific reason. He wants the readers to be able to understand that the Jewish elite, with all their knowledge, all their wisdom, they have very little faith. And yet this woman doesn't know the law. She's a woman. She was never taught the law. She was never taught how to read scripture. But yet, she follows the law. What Luke is trying to get us to focus on is that even this little bit of faith, these two copper coins given in desperation, have far more value than the heaps of bags of coins that the Jewish elite were putting in the offering plate. This is important. Because as, as teenagers, most of you don't earn money. Very few of you have part-time jobs. Very few of you have allowances. And whatever little money you do have, typically is spent before you can get it. Either because mom and dad takes it from you and puts it in a savings account for the future, or maybe it's to pay for gas, or cell phone, or car insurance, or a car note. But what Luke wants you to focus on is that even you, young kids, teenagers, you are still expected and still required to give to God. Even if it's just a penny, even if at school you find a penny on the ground, when you come to church, put that in the offering plate. You see, that gift, because you have nothing, holds a lot of weight to God. And what he's trying to identify is that the offering that the Jewish elite give, well, it's nice. It helps the temple work. It helps the, the synagogues operate. It pays salaries and it pays for food. The difference between their tithing and the widow's tithing is that they're giving out wealth. So the offering plate comes by and they're talking to their best friend. Hey, did you, did you see the Astros play the other day? Oh, man, it was such a great game. Oh, here's off the plate. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I just love the way the girl to play. And they pass the plate. I ain't even thinking about it. It's just second. It just just goes in one ear right out the other. All right. It's not. It's not important. Not from plate comes comes to a kid. He has nothing. He's sitting there and look at the offering plate. He reaches into his pocket, grabs a dollar. The sisters over there annoying him, and or maybe his little brother's kicking him in the shin. But he stops for a second. And he puts it in there and he prays over it. And he's thinking about God when he's giving it. It's important to that child that God knows he's giving up what he has. And that's what we're trying to help us understand with this story. And this is why that Jesus identifies this for his disciples. So that they can understand, listen, guys, this giant wealth, these giant temples, that nice clothes that they, the, those Jewish leaders wear, Listen, that means nothing. Trust me, I come from the Father. I can tell you his kingdom, his treasury. Listen, you couldn't even, even if you were Bill Gates and, and the, who's the Facebook guy? Um, Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg combined. You couldn't even come close to one fraction of a tenth of a percent of whatever of God's treasury. But then when you give, give with a gracious heart. Focus on your Lord because Guess what? He gives up his life for you. He gives up everything for you. And this is what Luke wants us to identify. This is why he, he brings up this story that the, the other Gospels, 
they talk about this, but they word it differently. All right? And there's a question that I want you to kind of pray over tonight that, that deal with this. So we have this widow who has nothing. She gives in her last two copper coins. Here's a question I want you to pray over. Then I want you to go to God with. What happened to her? I mean, did God have a gracious heart and bless her with wealth beyond her imagination? Did she die? Did she just disappear? What happened to this widow after her, her gift? When she gave this gift, there was a whole bunch of people around. So what happened to them? How, what sort of impact did that gift that she gave have on the other people observing her? Ask this of God. See what he tells you. And lastly, how did that story affect the disciples? As, as they were sitting there hanging out with Jesus... And they saw this old woman giving up her, her copper coins. How do you think it impacted them? Especially with what they're being called to do. What do you think that did to them? Ask God this tonight when, when you're at home and you're just kind of laying down and trying to get ready for bed. Pray to God these questions. What happened to the widow? How did it have an impact on the people around her? And how did it have an impact on the disciples? Now we get to a topic that you guys love. We talk about this all the time. The end of the world. I don't know why you have fascination with this. I mean, it's going to happen regardless, but you guys love it. You, like, YouTube videos on my computer when, you know, I'm not in the office, something, all these crazy things happen in the world. It's, oh, it's the end of the world happening. But anyway, first thing I need to make abundantly clear about this, these verses that I read, this is not us, Okay. Christ is not talking about the eventual end of time. He is predicting what is about to happen over the next couple of generations. Uh, he is specifically talking to the, the people that are around him, the disciples, and those who are going to be reading these letters. All right? So when I read that, please don't think that, that Christ was prophesying what's soon to come and that our world's coming to an end and you know, Hurricane Harvey and Irma and the full moon and all that sort of stuff. No, that's, that's not what this is talking about. All right, I'm going to kind of unpack this a little bit so you can get a better understanding of why Jesus talked about these things. So, the first thing that I want you guys to understand is that Jesus, the, the physical man Jesus, died in about 33 AD. Okay? It's important that you understand this date because this is just months before. What he's talking about is just months before he goes to the crucifixion, okay? About 40 years later, a little less than 40 years later, Israel gets really upset with Rome, starts to revolt, and Rome comes in and crushes them. They destroy the temple, they sack uh, Israel, they burn it to the ground, and this is what Christ is talking about. You see, not only does his divinity help him to prophecy, prophesy about the future that's about to happen to Israel, but Jesus could, in his infinite wisdom, read the cultural environment. He could see that people were getting unruly and, and wanting to change. But they were doing it the wrong way. This is why he's fore foreshadowing it. This is why he's saying, guys, listen, I have spent three years now telling you exactly what to be doing. And not listening. So, hey, since you're not listening, good luck. Because it's about to come. Alright? The end is right around the corner. So, get prepared. But what he really wants to drive home is how difficult the lives of the disciples are about to become. Alright, this has been hard for them because they had to pick up and leave their families. Alright? Trey, where are you? Trey Martin. And so, so this is if Trey's dad said, hey, Julie, Trey, Jesus called me. Bye, guys. Good luck. Good luck living. Good luck surviving. I'm going to go follow Jesus. All right, he just picks up and leaves. All right, there's there's no, no heartfelt goodbyes. There's no like, okay, let me move this money into this account. Let me prepare this. Okay, Julie, you got to get ready. Right, no, this is just, I'm dropping everything. I'm going. All right? That's hard. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. Listen, that's easy. That's, that's a piece of cake. What's about to happen is going to be a lot worse. All right? They're going to hate you. 
because of me. They're going to want to physically harm you because of me. Because you're doing the right thing. Because you're living the right way. Because you're saying, hey, you know what? It's the Sabbath. I don't care. The Lord has blessed me to heal. I'm going to heal today because he asked me to. This is what he's preparing his disciples for. This is what he's trying to teach them and say, guys, you've got to really get ready for this. Because I'm not going to be here very much longer. Listen, I'm going to go to that cross. I'm going to take these beatings for you. But when I die and I go be with my father, I'm not here to take that for you anymore. You're going to have to take it on your own. You're going to have to burden this on your own. And it's going to be hard. I'm going to be right there with you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to love on you. But it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. But what Christ does in his typical fashion is he reassures them. This story is different than all the other Gospels. Because in the other Gospels, Christ tells them, guys, the Holy Spirit's going to be with you. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit with you. Yeah. Not this Gospel. He says, listen, Jake, I know you're going to go off and I know you're going to get up here. I know it's going to it's gonna suck. It's going to be hard. But I've got your back. All right? God's army has your back. All of his angels and everything in the kingdom of heaven has got your back. All right? This is different because this really gives the disciples confidence. Think about that for a second. The idea that you're, because of your faith, that someone is going to physically beat you up, but you know, hey, my dad's talking with your dad. Do you have that in your corner? Think how much confidence you would have. That's what he's doing. And, I mean, trust me. If I, if I told you that, listen, Miranda, someone does make fun of you. Like, seriously make fun of you. Like, they know your deepest, darkest secrets, and they're going to tell the whole school. But I've got your back. All right? It's not going to bother. When it starts happening, it's not going to bother. Because she knows that the ultimate king, the one who's going to die on the cross for her, has got her back. This is what's happening to the disciples. They just were told some very difficult, painful news. All right, these are men. These are not just like small little guys. These are big, type A machismo guys. All right, these are guys that would go on and, and join the military. These are guys that go on to be, you know, special forces and Navy SEALs. These are tough, tough dudes. So to have Christ tell them, hey, this is coming, and they're scared, all right, that's that's going to be intense. That's why he reassures them. That's why in this gospel, Luke is, is very intentional with identifying the fact that Christ walks with them. You see, Luke is trying to help the readers understand. I get you. The disciples understand what you're going through. Brother, hey, I feel you. I was, I was in prison. Two years ago, dude, I was in Rome. I was in prison for six months. They fed me moldy bread, had these maggots on it, and this gross, nasty water. That's what I got for six months. So trust me, dude, I know what you're going through. But listen, read this. What did Jesus just say? I'm going to be with you. All right, and he was with me. When I was in prison, he was with me. So this is what Luke's trying to identify. This is what Luke's trying to get his readers to understand. There's two questions I want you to pray over when it comes to, to the scripture and, and dealing with Christ talking about the end of the age. The first, the first question is, where in the world the disciples not just say, okay, Jesus, dude, I love you. This is great. I had a blast, but I'm gone. I'm done. I'm, I'm out of here. Why did they quit? All right? Ask God that. Why did the disciples quit when they heard this coming? And lastly, what were they experiencing during this lesson? When, when Jesus was teaching this film, what were they internally experiencing? And to end tonight, what, what I want to share with you guys is while Jesus isn't talking about the end of the age that we're going to experience, well, that maybe our grandkids, or great, 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 great grandkids are going to experience, it's not the end of the world that we see in movies. But what Christ does talk about is what we experience. Every single one of you have been bullied. Mm. 
You've been picked on, you've been made fun of, you've been pushed around. And it's been hard. You have felt that, that need for security and for safety. You've been desperate for someone to love you because everyone else doesn't, apparently. But Christ is sitting here telling you right now, I'm with you guys. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. And whatever happens to your physical body, I can heal it. I mean, look, I just spent three years healing lepers. Yeah. I can heal you. And the last thing that he wants you to hear, and this is hard, this is probably the most difficult thing, especially, and I'm part of this because I'm a millennial, the most difficult part of becoming a Christian, becoming a true disciple, is the very last part Verse 19. No, actually, verse 18 and verse, verse 19. No, question. Verse 17 through, from, through 19. That you will die because of your faith. All right? There's no way around it. For us, it doesn't necessarily mean a physical death where we actually have a funeral and we're buried or cremated. No. But death to the life that we believe in. The death of what we thought was true but kept on causing us to make mistakes. The death that caused depression because we didn't get what we wanted. Christmas is right around the corner and that frustration that we didn't get that video game we asked for, that shirt and those boots. That's the death that, that we experience. That we give up this, this life that, that the American culture indoctrinates you into. In three weeks, we have, we have Black Friday, the biggest American holiday of the year. It's all about you. What can you gain from, from society? But then when you lose that life, when you become a disciple, when you give up your life, you gain eternity in heaven. All right? And this is not something to make you feel good. This is real talk. All right? This is a place that we will eventually be at. This is a place that we all will experience. But it is an eventuality that you will lose this life. And I can testify to that. Grew up in the church. All right? Grew up in the Methodist church, went through confirmation, baptism, the whole nine yards. I did everything. But eventually I left the faith. I left the faith because I could not reconcile my faith with my personal desires. I wanted what God wasn't giving me. I wanted to be the American Messi. I wanted to change the face of American soccer. I wanted to be the greatest player that has ever walked. It didn't happen. I wanted my brother to stop being sick with cancer. It didn't happen. So I walked away from faith because I wasn't getting what I wanted. Because Black Friday teaches me, hey, it's all about me. I get a flat screen TV. It's 200 bucks. Yeah, I'm going to get that for myself. Forget all you guys. I don't want to give you anything. I want it for me. And for two years, I walked away from Christ. But you see, it's like now. No, time is up. Your end has come. You are going to die right now. And in September of 2009, I did. My old life died. And I was born new because of my faith. Because even though I walked away, it was still in there somewhere. Every single one of you guys will experience that because Christ says so. You will experience tribulation and trials in your faith. You will question it. There's no way around it. And when you die, you will be reborn. Because Christ, who died and saved us from our sins, God saw fit to resurrect him, to bring him back to life. And if our king does that, he will give that to us as well. I want to invite Sam, I'm not Sam, 
uh, well, I do want to invite Sam to come up, but I also want to invite Caleb and Morgan to come on up. Um, you know, it's the first Wednesday of the month, so it's Communion Sunday. And so as we come to the table, I'm going to hand it over to these two to kind of lead us in communion to kind of talk about how communion changes you, how it's changed them and, and the way that God is leading them towards ministry. So guys, I'll leave it to you. Hi guys. And uh, how communion kind of changed me, well, when I first took it, I was a little kid. But when I actually kind of under, understood what it meant, that it was, you know, kind of, it was the cleansing of God forgiving you, you know, mm. the Last Supper, all that stuff. It just really meant a lot to me. It touched me. And over the years, I've kind of learned more about it and how it's led me towards ministry. So that I just want to be able to give people that chance as well. So when I was a kid, I was, I was really young. Uh, after communion one time, uh, one of my friends took it, and they began crying. And I, I never really understood why they were crying. You know, in my head, I was almost like accusing them, like, why, why are you crying? And uh, as I became older, I realized why they were crying. You see, this meal represents something much more than just piece of bread and a drink from the cup. This is God's body. See, Jesus, before he went into uh, the next day, he, at that table, you know, everything is you know, casual. And they always set aside a piece of bread, a loaf of bread, and a cup of wine. And that was for uh, the coming, uh, the new coming. And so after this, this meal is done with, Jesus goes and he grabs the cup and he grabs the bread. He takes it. He looks at all of them, you know, with a serious face. He said, this is, this is my body. And he broke the bread. He said, this is for you. He said, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And to me, what it represents is it's him washing away your sins and washing away the, the troubles of your life and giving you a refresher. So, uh, y'all can come ahead and take of this and uh, be reminded of what this means, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us to have eternal life. And uh, if y'all feel led to... Uh, Come and pray at the altar. Come and pray at your seat. Just uh, have a little alone time with God. Separate yourself from your friends. And uh, just spend a little bit of time in prayer. So y'all come on. Come on up.